Well, welcome to Easter service here at Kara City. We're so, yeah, you can be excited about that. We worship a risen Savior today and every Sunday. I'm the lead pastor here. My name is Nathan Reimer, and we're so glad you're here to be a part of us uh, on this Easter Sunday. Now, I don't know exactly what you were expecting in an Easter service, but I have a pretty good idea that you're here to hear the victory story of Jesus rising from the dead. But I'm going to go in a completely different direction. We're going to preach out of the Old Testament today. We've got some cool Old Testament stories. I'm kidding. We're not going to disappoint you this morning with that. We are going to preach the victory story of Jesus. We've been in a series for the last few weeks called Death to Life, and we've been looking at some of Jesus' final teachings before he goes to the cross. And it was in the book of John that we took all of this from, uh, the Gospel of John in the New Testament. And today we're going to celebrate the resurrection story out of that same book of the Bible. So we're going to spend some time talking about what Easter looked like and the victory of Easter. But you need to understand that the Easter story didn't start out with victory. That's not how it began. Now, Jesus' closest followers were called his apostles. And they had been following him for about three years. And they had been following this amazing teacher who could cure sickness and disease with just a touch of his hand or a spoken word. They'd been following him for a while and it was never boring. They'd seen him do amazing things. They'd seen him take five loaves of bread and two small fish. Think quarter pounder with cheese meal. They took that and Jesus turned that into a meal that fed over 5,000 people. And they gathered up the leftovers after the meal, and they gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers from that quarter pounder with cheese meal. And they'd seen him bring Lazarus back from the dead, even though Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And they had seen all these different events, and they just knew that Jesus was different than anybody they'd ever been around. And Jesus was destined to be a great king. And because they were his closest followers... They were going to be governors and generals and leaders. But on Thursday, things began to change pretty quickly. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was arrested by a big group of people that were led by the Jewish religious leaders. But I'm sure at that point, the disciples were thinking, yeah, we've seen Jesus do crazy cool things. He's going to get out of this. No big deal. And maybe this is part of the plan. Maybe he is going to start this moment to revolt against the Roman Empire. And everything is about to be awesome. But on Friday, things went from bad to worse. Jesus was brought before the Roman governor, a guy named Pontius Pilate, who condemned Jesus to be crucified, even though he could find nothing wrong with him. But I'm sure the disciples still thought, you know, this is Jesus. He's still going to be all right. But hope began to die as a few hours later, Roman guards drove seven-inch spikes through Jesus' hands and through his feet. And I'm sure at that point, there was still this desperate hope, this desperate glimpse of something still happening positive where Jesus would come off the cross. But then Jesus prayed, not a prayer they were expecting. Jesus is on the cross and he prays that the people that hung him there, would not that they would be punished. He didn't pray that someone would rescue him from the cross. He prayed for forgiveness for those people who were murdering him. That wasn't what they were expecting. They were expecting Jesus to rise up and conquer his enemies, not pray for his enemies to be forgiven. And I'm sure there was still some last desperate hope. But then a few hours later, Jesus uttered these last words, it is finished. And then just a few moments later, he hung his head and he died. That's how it started. And so Jesus was buried in this tomb that was made out of the side of a mountain. It was a cave. And there was a boulder running, rolled in front of the opening to the tomb that probably weighed about two tons so nobody could move it. They put the Roman gar governor's seal across it so that no one could mess with the tomb. In fact, they put Roman guards outside the tomb to make sure that all hope died with Jesus. They didn't want somebody coming in and stealing the body and starting a rumor that Jesus had risen for the, from the dead. And I'm sure when this happened, the words of Jesus rang with finality for the disciples. It is finished. The great adventure and all the miracles, finished. All of the things that Jesus was going to do, finished. Death had won. You know, the Apostle John tells us in chapter 20 that all the apostles were actually hiding in a locked room because they were scared to death that they were going to be arrested as well and maybe even killed for being close followers of Jesus. 
And we so often on Easter Sunday skip directly from the cross to an empty tomb. But the disciples didn't get to do that. They had to live through the hopelessness of Friday evening and all day on Saturday and Sunday morning uh, when they began to wake up. And think about what they were wondering. At this point, they're scared they could be arrested and killed. They're wondering if somehow they can go back to their families and start their old jobs again and somehow put things back together. For them, outside the tomb, death had won. Hope was lost. Expectations were shattered. Life had ended. But inside the tomb, something very different was happening. Inside that tomb that so often represents death and ending and sadness and finality, inside that most unlikely of places, new life was beginning. New hope was being created. Things were changing. In this tomb where Jesus' body was sealed up, there was a great battle between good and evil, between life and death. But let's be honest, it wasn't much of a fight. Jesus defeated death in that moment once and for all, and he threw down the chains of sin forever for all of us. Victory came out of that moment, out of that tomb. The chains of sin were gone. The new hope, not just for Jesus, but for all of us. You know, it was in that moment in the tomb where Christianity was actually born. Because up to that time, there was no such thing as Christianity. There were followers of Jesus. But when Jesus died on the cross, pretty much all those followers were gone. But when Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity was born and the church began. The church that lasted over 2,000 years to this point began in that moment in the tomb. That's what we celebrate today. That's what we worship today as a risen Jesus. But see, when Jesus died, everybody went back to their families, went back to their jobs because they expected Jesus to do what dead people do, stay dead. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't stay dead. And in this moment, Jesus turned sorrow into joy, brokenness into restoration, fear into faith, and death to life. The Apostle Paul was an early church leader, and he was one that went around teaching and preaching, and he wrote a good part of the New Testament. And he lived about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And he writes this account. It's a letter to the church in Corinth. And it's in our Bible in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. I want to read that section to you. And then we'll talk about what it means. This is what Paul says to that church in Corinth. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, the most important thing. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, who's Peter. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then again to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So as you're deciding what you believe about the resurrection story, I want to tell you about that passage of Scripture. There's really no historical dispute that Paul was an early church leader, that he played a big role in the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. That's really undisputed. It's also undisputed that Jesus was a real historical man, that he was a teacher, and that he was executed on a cross by the Roman Empire. Those things are pretty much undisputed by all historians, whether they're Christian historians or not. Where the dispute comes in is what happened in that tomb. Did Jesus stay dead like everybody else, or did Jesus do something in that tomb that changed everything? The Apostle Paul wrote this letter in AD 55, or about AD 55, which is just 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. That's significant. You also need to understand that there's really no dispute among any historians that Paul wrote this particular letter or that it was written somewhere around A.D. 55. There's a few historians that would say maybe it was four or five years after that fact. There is some dispute about whether Paul may have written some of the letters that are attributed to him by non-Christian historians, but none about this passage that we now call 1 Corinthians, this letter. There's no dispute on what happened there. And in this letter, Paul makes this crazy claim that Jesus didn't stay dead. And then he makes this outrageous claim that if it wasn't true, it would have been laughable. He says Jesus appeared to 500 people all at the same time, and most of those people are still living. 
In other words, verify, check it out to see that what I'm saying is true. And you also need to understand that even before 55 AD when Paul wrote this letter, Paul had been hanging out with the apostles and other eyewitnesses to the resurrection. He was going around the Roman Empire preaching and teaching that Jesus rose from the dead. And then 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, he writes down this account. You may have been told that Christianity centers on a Bible that was written hundreds of years after the events that they're recorded. Maybe you were told that the first time the resurrection was written down was generations after it happened. And through that process, myth can come into play and things can get changed or thought of differently. But that's not what happened. Just 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, this account is written that Jesus rose from the dead. I want to read to you an actual eyewitness account from somebody that was there, somebody that wrote down what they saw. This is an account of Easter morning by the Apostle John in John 20, 1 through 8. Here's what he says. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's how John would refer to himself, the disciple that Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside It says he saw and believed. You know, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture in all the Bible because it's one of those little moments that reminds me that this stuff is real. This is written down by people who were actually there and they recorded what they saw. How do I know that? So John makes the point that they ran to the tomb. What does he say? He was faster than Peter. Only a dude writes down in the most important story in all of human history that he won a race. And think about that. If this account had been written down hundreds of years later, that wouldn't have been in there. This account does not matter for people reading the Easter story hundreds or thousands of years later. It doesn't matter that John was faster than Peter, but who did it matter to? John. And so he put it in there. And so we see the truth that these are eyewitnesses who are writing down what happened. What happened inside the tomb was real. You know, sometimes it's better to not just hear a story, but to see it. And so I want to show you a video of of a story that comes from a TV show where you get to see Peter and John go to the tomb, and then you get to see one of Jesus' female followers, Mary Magdalene. Check out this video.
this story is why we're here. It's why we're here every Sunday. Just think about the apostles in that moment when they started to believe that maybe, maybe, just maybe, something even bigger than Jesus coming down off the cross would happen, that Jesus would come out of an empty tomb. Now that would be a story of death to life. You see, when you come back from the grave, you are whoever you say you are. Jesus didn't just talk the talk of being God. When he walked out of the grave, he walked the walk of being God. And that changed everything. See, it was in the grave, a place that so often represents death and sadness and mourning, where something amazing happened. You know, 2,000 years later, the grave still so often represents death for us as, as a society, right? It represents ending and sadness. But, you know, I've noticed a difference between funerals for Christians, followers of Jesus, and for those who don't believe in this resurrection of the Easter story. In funerals when there's a non-Christian and non-believers, there's this sense of finality, an ultimate loss of hope, an ultimate ending. In a funeral for a Christian, there's a different feel. There's still sadness and loss, but there's not this loss of hope. There's not this permanent end. They know that something better still remains. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in another one of his letters in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For Christians, death means the end of this earthly body. It does. And so often by the time we reach death, our bodies are so broken down and busted by disease or injury or a fight against some cancer battle that they're pretty useless to us at that point in time. And something happens in our grave because of what happened in Jesus' grave. I think about this like a cocoon for a caterpillar. Think about that. When a caterpillar builds a cocoon, it's basically building a tomb for itself where its life as a caterpillar ends forever. But that's not the end of the story. The caterpillar comes out of that grave as something completely different, as a butterfly that's even more beautiful and better than ever. That's what the grave means for followers of Jesus. You know, I've seen older Christians who have been in a struggle with the end stages of life, whose bodies are not working like they used to, excited about going to the grave because they know that these bodies that have let them down, these bodies that can't do the things that they could do when they were younger, they're about to leave that behind and they're about to experience new life and regeneration and be with Jesus face to face. I've even seen young people who are married and have younger kids who are in the end stages of a fight with cancer have confidence and hope going to the tomb. Now, they're sad that they're leaving behind family and they're sad about the loss of this life, but they have a hope that's different. Here's what's different. Because Jesus didn't stay dead, we don't either. Here's how Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. He says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? You know, the early Christians, they usually didn't call it dying. They called it falling asleep. Because we all know what happens when you fall asleep. What? You wake back up. Because of Easter, the grave represents so much more to us than death. Because of Jesus, the tomb means life, new life, changed life. There's a reason that John 3.16 is the most famous verse in all the Bible. And here's why. It tells the entire death to life story in a single sentence. Here's what it says, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him won't have to die, won't perish, but will have everlasting life. Think about that. God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die so that you could be forgiven and so you could spend eternity with him. Now, let me say that a different way. On the cross, God could have either saved his only son, Jesus, or he could have saved you. And he chose you. That's how much God loves you that he chose you over his only son that he had spent eternity with already. That's how big Easter is. And I want to try to help you understand how big a deal John 3.16 is and how big a deal Easter is and what for followers of Jesus, what 
the Easter story, what the resurrection story means for us. When Jesus died on the cross, you were set free from something. We know that, right? We were set free from the chains of sin and death. We were set free from death being the end of our story. But what you may not know is we weren't just set free from things. We were set free to things. Let me try to explain that with an illustration. Let's say you go into a restaurant. You're going with some friends. They invited you to this restaurant. You can't afford it. Everything is more expensive than you can really afford. But you go because you don't want to look like uh, you didn't have enough money to eat with them. So you go and, man, you look at the menu. It's worse than you thought. You, you can't afford anything on this menu. But then you see some things that don't have a price out beside them. They just have the, the words or the MP initials. There's my item, minimal price right there. That's what I'm going for. And so you order an MP appetizer, an MP a meal, and an MP dessert. And then the bill comes later and you realize that MP did not mean minimal price. It meant market price. And you don't know what kind of market they go to, but it must be a really fancy one because everything's way more expensive than the other items you saw. You can't afford to pay for this. You, you think for a minute, maybe I could put it on my credit card, but, but you don't have a big enough balance. You think maybe I could go back and I could work really hard for the restaurant washing dishes, but you can't work hard enough to pay off this debt. You're in a mess. You realize this is going to end very badly for you. But just as you're starting to panic, the owner of the restaurant comes over to your table and he says, look, I got this. Don't worry about the bill. I'm taking care of it. You don't owe me anything. Right? That's the way we think about the Easter story. You were saved or free from the cost of the meal. You may have even seen this meme on Facebook or social media here recently of an invoice or a bill that says, you know, you're sin free, paid in full, paid in full. That's how we think of Easter so often is that we were saved to be free from something. But the Easter story is even bigger than that. You weren't just saved free from something. You were saved to be free to something. So imagine that the owner says, and not only is this meal free, but man, you can come in here and eat for free anytime you want to. And here's why. You're now a co-owner of the restaurant, and I'm adopting you into my family. You're now a part of the family that owns this place. Do you see how you're set free from something, but also set free to something? That's what the Easter story does for us. It sets us free from the chains of sin and death, but it sets us free to be part of God's family. That's what the Bible tells us. It sets us free to be co-heirs with Jesus. It's not just a zero balance for sin. It's something even much bigger than that. You know, it's almost scandalous how amazing God's grace was on the cross and in the resurrection story because we get to be part of God's family. We're given eternal life with Jesus. That's why we talk about Easter as being the story of death to life. But, but if we're honest, I think some of you guys would say, that's great, Nathan. It's, it's awesome that I get new life one day, that I've got this eternity thing coming. But, but what does that do for me now? Yeah, new life in heaven one day, no tears in heaven. That's all awesome and good. But, but my heart is breaking right now. It feels like I'm losing control of my kids. They're, they're spiraling out of control, and I don't know how to fix that. My marriage... Man, it's a struggle every single day, and I don't know where we go from here. My job, I don't like it very much, and it's not going all that well. And not to mention, we've got more bills than we can afford. We've got credit card debt that we don't know what we're going to do with. And if that's not bad enough, it seems like that every week we hear about some new tragedy in our country and in our world. Or maybe for some of you, things are going pretty well right now. You have a good job, and you've got family, and you've got a house that you like, but still, life just feels like it's not complete, like there's something missing, and you're wondering what the Easter story can change for you. Think about it this way. Let's say this week you get a call from an attorney who tells you about a long-lost relative who won a huge lottery of $100 million, and this long-lost relative has decided that he's going to share his lottery winnings with all of his family, and even with you as a distant relative, and you don't even know who he is. And so this attorney says he's going to pay you $2 million. Man, you're excited. Life is about to change. You suddenly, you're thinking, man, are the credit card debt I can pay off, the bills that I can now afford, you're starting to think about things that you could never buy that for the first time you can afford to buy. And you're planning out your first big vacation when the phone rings again. And it's the attorney saying, look, 
So there's a little problem. It's still good news, but there's a little problem. Your long-lost relative didn't check the, the cash payment option. He checked the annuity option. So instead of being paid out all at once, it's going to be paid out over the next 20 years. And so he's going to, he's going to bless his relatives one at a time over the next 20 years. And because you're a distant relative, you're year 20. It's still good news. You're going to one day get $2 million. Retirement is taken care of. But man, it doesn't fix the bills right now. It doesn't change your life today. And so it feels very different. And I wonder if that's not how we often leave an Easter service. Like, it's great that I've got new life one day, but, but I'm not sure I can wait for eternity. I need something different now. And then by the time we get home from church and we start getting ready for work on Monday and getting the kids ready to go to school, we're overwhelmed and depressed and we're right back to where we were before Easter service. But what if I told you that the message of Easter isn't new life begins one day? What if I told you that the message of Easter is new life begins now? You don't have to wait. Listen to how Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here, right? Paul doesn't say one day new life will come. He says new is now, new is here. And that's the message of Easter. Easter doesn't just change things for us one day. New life begins now. Eternity has already started for you when you follow Jesus. So when you die, you don't start eternity. You just continue eternity in a new form, in a new body that's perfect. Now, let me be real clear. When you follow Jesus, you still live in an old world with old world problems that's busted and messed up. That doesn't change. But what changes for you is that now you are a new creation. You are different, and you have God to help you with the struggles in this old world. And, and so my prayer for you is this, that you would experience new life now, that you would take from this service the power of the resurrection, that you'd have a new perspective on life because you followed Jesus. When, our, when we follow Jesus, our old mistakes and all our sins, those things are washed away. That's why we baptize people by immersion who make a decision to follow Jesus. Baptism is this beautiful picture of what's happening to us. Baptism is that moment where we die to our old life of sins, we're buried in the water, and then we come out, just like Jesus came out of the tomb, we come out of the, the water, a new creation. That's a picture of what's happening to us on the inside. It's an illustration of what happens to us on the inside. When we follow Jesus, that happens. Listen now, the, the Apostle Paul says this, in Romans 6, 4 through 5. He says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul's saying that this immersion is this beautiful picture of what just happened, that we became a new creation in Jesus. And, and some of you may not know this, but... The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo, the original word they used, means to plunge or immerse in water. And that's the reason that they did it in the early church. It was always by immersion because no other way fits this beautiful illustration of dying with Jesus and coming back to life out of the water. It's a picture of what happened inside the tomb, us becoming new. New life through an empty tomb. Some of you guys are thinking... Nathan, it can't be that easy. Like, you don't know what I've done. You don't, you don't know what I did last night. You don't know what my thoughts were this morning. But I promise you it is. New life begins now. Jesus says that over and over. We don't worship a God of second chances. We worship a God that took our place. I, I, hear, God, I hear people say sometimes that we have a God of second chances. And that sounds cool. And, and there's some truth to that. But it's not the full truth. Think about it this way. If you gave me a second chance to get it right, I'd mess it up again. Think about this like a, if somebody gave me a calculus test. If I took a calculus test right now, I would absolutely fail it because I don't know how to do calculus. And then out of your great mercy and, and love, you let me take it again, what would I do? I'd fail it again. You let me take it 23 times, I'm going to fail it every single time. I can't get it right because I don't know calculus. But now if you let my son Doug 
who is an engineering student at Texas A&M who's taken way th things higher than calculus, you let him take that test for me, I pass with flying colors. That's what our God did for us. He took our place. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he wasn't talking about his life. He's talking about the payment of our sin. In that moment, sin was defeated once and for all. Jesus had finished the task. And then when he rose from the grave, the power of the resurrection became available for every single one of us. That's what Easter is all about. Then through his sacrifice, he took all of our sin and he gave us all of his perfection. That's what Easter is. How awesome would it be today to be given a clean slate, a fresh start, a new chance, a brand new life. You know, there's no better day than Easter to give your life to Jesus and to commit to be baptized because Easter is all about new. Easter is all about death to life. We have a baptism day planned for next Sunday. It's our third year anniversary. You heard that earlier. Big deal. We're going to have a great time. But the biggest part of that day is baptisms, that picture of people's lives being changed. We'd love you to be a part of that. You, I'll be in the back in just a minute if you wanna come back there and talk to me. You can also just put that on your connection card and we'll reach out to you this week. You know, some of you guys may be here and you, you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, but you've never really taken that next step to be baptized. This is the time. Or maybe for some of you, you've never really followed Jesus. You haven't made that decision to make him Lord and Savior of your life. Today is the day. Jesus is calling on you to repent of your sins and to follow him. There are probably a lot of reasons running through your mind about why you shouldn't make those decisions today. You're thinking, look, I came with family. I, I didn't even, I don't even know this church. They brought me today. And so it would be really awkward to make that decision with friends and family here. Or, or, or maybe you're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not a person who rushes big decisions and this is a big decision and I think I'm just going to kind of wait and think about it. Or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, but you've never been baptized because you know it's going to upset Aunt Edna or grandmother or somebody else. And I get all of those things. But let me tell you, if friends brought you to church on Easter, they're going to be thrilled if you make that decision. And you may not have been planning to be baptized, but Jesus had been planning for this moment since before you were born. And I get that somebody may get upset about you making a decision to be baptized by immersion. But Jesus never said that following him was easy. And he never said it was always convenient or that it didn't cause problems sometimes. After Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he went back to heaven, the apostle Peter preached the first real sermon of this new Christian church. And it was on a day we call Pentecost. And he called people out to repent of their sins and be baptized. And the Bible says that 3,000 people that one day decided to be baptized. Those people didn't get up that morning deciding to be baptized. They went to hear some cool event that was going on. And they made a decision to follow Jesus. They didn't expect to meet a risen Savior. But neither did the apostles when they watched Jesus sealed in the tomb. The, the tug that you're feeling right now to make a decision for Jesus, th that's not nerves. <laughs> That's the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will never tell you to wait to make a decision. That's nowhere in the Bible to follow Jesus. Listen to what the Bible says about that in Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. It says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. That's the call. What are you waiting for? Be baptized. My challenge for you today is not just to hear the story of death to life in the Easter story, but to become part of that story by following Jesus and deciding to be baptized. And I promise if you do that, it will change everything. Let's pray.